Okay, so I'm going to be talking uh, in this section about uh, migrating from Fedora 3 to Fedora 4, which I think uh, is a uh, sort of um, topic that is, is um, uh, very popular uh, and something that everyone is sort of um, wondering about. I, I think most people here probably are Fedora 3 users, and so um, this is a topic that um, is, uh, is one that's of great interest. Uh, I should note at the outset here that uh, we don't have uh, sort of migration tools yet uh, or necessarily um, concrete best practices in terms of how to move from Fedora 3 to Fedora 4. Um, in part, that's deliberate. Um, as we sort of talked about yesterday, Fedora 4.0, the release that's targeted for this year, um, is intended for new Fedora repositories. So the goal here is to be able to stand up a fresh Fedora 4.0 implementation without worrying about legacy content from Fedora 3 uh, and just making sure that everything works, uh, that we can stand these instances up in production uh, and have them work well without any major problems. Um, next year, we'll be releasing Fedora 4.1, uh, and that release, among other things, will target uh, migration specifically from Fedora 3 to Fedora 4. Uh, and there's some work going on right now to uh, make progress towards that goal. Uh, if you go on the wiki, you can take a look at some of the beta pilots that are currently running. Several of them are looking at migrating content from existing uh, Fedora repositories, and I imagine others will start to do this as well. Um, as people start to do that, uh, use cases will start to emerge uh, in terms of what um, uh, what needs to be migrated, what kind of considerations we need to take uh, take into account. Uh, and, and as that progresses, we'll start to see some tools emerge, we'll start to see some uh, documentation, uh, some best practices uh, emerge. Um, so if you have an interest in this, I would encourage you to sort of get involved in that uh, conversation, whether it's um, starting up a, a sort of migration yourself, uh, or getting in touch with some of the folks that are currently doing this. Uh, for example, um, I know that uh, in, the, in the Hydra context, there's been some uh, calls out for use cases around migrations for, for some of the beta pilot work that's going on. So if you're a Hydra user and you have migration use cases, you might want to hop on the Hydra list and, and maybe get involved with that project. Um, and, you know, otherwise, joining in on, on the discussion in terms of posting to the Fedora mailing lists, um, joining in on the weekly committer calls uh, or committing some developer time to the um, Fedora 4 sprints just to make sure that uh, your particular migration use cases are covered. Um, and this is largely because everyone's Fedora 3 repositories are slightly different. Uh, what The way that Islandora handles content in Fedora 3 is different than the way that Hydra handles content, which is different than the way that you may handle content with your custom front end. And even in amongst those systems, people are doing slightly different things. They have different data streams, these different standards for how they name things. They have different concerns uh, using different functions and components of the Fedora stack and may also have interacting components uh, in other application stacks that are all sort of coming together. So this issue of sort of migrating from Fedora 3 to Fedora 4 uh, is never going to be a, a sort of one click, you know, make my Fedora 3 repository a Fedora 4 repository. Um, but there will be tools and standards and documentation and best practices. Uh, and again, I, it's, it's going to take community involvement. It's, it's going to be a process. So I would encourage you, if you have these use cases, if you have concerns, uh, get involved at this point rather than sort of waiting to see what everyone else comes up with over the next few months because you may find that your use cases are not covered. Uh, so please do get involved in that process. It's the only way that we... Um, uh, get to a successful point of uh, being able to migrate from Fedora 3 to Fedora 4. Um, and, you know, it's important to note that this is something that we really do want to support, that we have a strong desire uh, amongst the Fedora community to uh, support this, this particular use case. It's just that it's going to take uh, community involvement to do that. So um, this presentation in particular is going to focus on some of the planning and considerations um, for doing just that. I've got um, a few learning outcomes, uh, again, for this presentation, um, starting with just kind of understanding some of the main differences between Fedora 3 and Fedora 4. This came up um, during discussions yesterday, uh, and I think it's, it's a, an important first step to understanding how to migrate content is just knowing what's different between uh, Fedora, 4, uh, Fedora 3 and Fedora 4. Um, I'll also just talk about uh, some of the considerations that you should be keeping in mind. And these at this point are just considerations. Not all of these have concrete answers 
uh, at this point, but the things that you'll need to think about if you have a migration use case in terms of what your content looks like and what you're trying to achieve by uh, migrating it to Fedora 4. Uh, and finally, and, and maybe most importantly here, is just exploring some of the new possibilities that Fedora 4 opens up for uh, Fedora 3 content. So I alluded to this in, in my previous presentation, but um, you know, it is very likely possible to uh, make your Fedora 4 repository and the content in it look uh, very, very similar to uh, your Fedora 3 repository, but in some cases uh, that might not be uh, all that desirable. It, it might actually make more sense, uh, and maybe this is a stopgap approach, um, but it might make more sense to consider how Fedora 4 can uh, give you an opportunity to make your data better, to do some enhancement um, and um, improve your repository, uh, rather than just trying to sort of shoehorn in Fedora 3 content into Fedora 4 without making any changes. Uh, again, that's likely something that you could do, uh, but I think there's some great opportunities here. I'll, I'll talk about some of that stuff. Uh, so to begin, um, I'll just go through some of the, the main differences uh, between Fedora 3 and Fedora 4, uh, and we'll have some time after this um, for discussion as well. So uh, if you want to dive into some of these in more detail, Andrew and I can um, try to answer some of those questions. Uh, so first up, this kind of difference between the way the object model in Fedora 3 works compared to the object model in Fedora 4. So uh, in Fedora 3, of course, you have uh, XML objects using Fedora's uh, Foximal uh, representation. Uh, and these objects uh, support both uh, inline XML uh, and XML data streams, uh, amongst binary data streams and other things as well. But uh, focusing on sort of the XML side of things here, in Fedora 3, you have content that, um, you know, your, your Foximal object uh, may have inline XML, um, you might have an audit trail, and it might have, uh, you may be representing your metadata uh, in line in the, in the flock object. Um, or uh, you may have XML data streams that represent your metadata as well as uh, relationship information, uh, perhaps rights information, could be other things there too, uh, represented as sort of managed uh, content in Fedora 3. Uh, in Fedora 4, uh, what we have are uh, re web resources. So your, your object uh, in Fedora 4 um, has a URI. Uh, and, you know, again, the terminology here is a little bit slippery, but uh, objects and data streams in Fedora 4 are both types of web resources. Uh, so we can still refer to them as objects and data streams. And in fact, they have uh, RDF types that sort of define them as such. But uh, ultimately, they're both just types of resources. They have URIs um, and they have um, RDF properties. Uh, so this is one of the new uh, features. I already kind of mentioned this in the previous um, presentation, but um, all of these um, resources have properties associated with them. Uh, that are natively RDF, um, but you can still have XML data streams. So uh, if you have a mods XML file, if you have um, you know other XML files in your Fedora 3 repository, uh, those can still be represented as managed data streams in XML format in Fedora 4. Uh, however, you could also convert these to RDF properties. So when you do your migration, um, you could take your managed data streams and you could convert these over to be RDF properties on the object. Uh, best practices for these things will emerge as people start to do this. Right now, this is a possibility um, that you could uh, take into consideration. Um, inline XML is no longer supported in the sense that we don't have Foximal objects anymore. So this is a pretty major change, um, but the default sort of way that an object is represented in Fedora 4 is not an XML. Uh, so there is no Foximal and there is no inline XML, which means when you uh, convert your Foximal objects to um, Fedora 4 resources, you'll need to think about what to do with that inline XML. Uh, very likely, most of it could be converted to managed XML if that's what you choose to do with it. So if you had um, your you know, metadata represented in the, in the Foximal document inline, you could just convert that to um, a managed XML data stream. Uh, or depending on what the content is, you might want to convert it to RDF properties. Um, Again, you know, the standards for this are still emerging, and I think different people will have different use cases and take different approaches here, but um, you'll have to consider what to do with that um, as the, the, the possibility of having inline XML is, is no longer there. Another difference is just the way that uh, content is structured uh, in the repository. So I'll talk about the file system in a second here, but just in the repository in Fedora 3, um, you have basically all your objects and data streams at, at, the, at the top level of the repository. So there's no real inherent structure to a Fedora 3 repository. Uh, you use RDF 
to semantically create a structure that's more like a graph. Uh, and often you would create collections and, and you know, objects and create complex relationships there, but all done through RDF. And in terms of the actual repository itself, there's no structure. It's, it's just a, uh, it, it's, it's just flat. Um, Fedora 4 uh, is quite different in this regard. So um, all your objects and data streams, all your resources are in fact in a hierarchy. There is a root node or a root resource um, and everything descends from that. Uh, so this is sort of the, the structure of the repository. Um, it can be done uh, in a sort of logical fashion, uh, and I'll talk about this a little further, and I think Andrew might mention it as well. Um, in the way that you structure your data, um, it can be structured the way it might logically rep be represented. So you could have, um, you know, uh, resources that represent um, uh, paths that represent collections. Uh, and groupings of objects that kind of make logical sense, or um, you can uh, just throughout the repository uh, create a hierarchy that doesn't actually represent how things are logically uh, represented. The main reason for the hierarchy is performance. Uh, it's just the way that the system um, behaves and it's far more uh, performant when you have a deeply nested hierarchy than when you have uh, everything sitting at the same level. Um, but how you choose to take advantage of that or not is kind of up to you. And again, there's still some kind of emerging standards and practices for, for um, how, this, uh, how this will work and how um, different groups and institutions might, um, might implement this and uh, take advantage of the street tree structure or not. With regard to the file system specifically, things are a little bit different. Uh, so in the Fedora 3 file system, uh, you have an objects directory and a data streams directory. Uh, and they're kind of organized in a pear tree structure. You can uh, look that up if you're not familiar with it. It's a CDL uh, structure, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's the way that things are sort of organized a file system. Uh, in Fedora 4, you still have um, uh, these directories um, and data streams are still in a, in a pear tree organizations, but your objects are actually stored in a database. Um, so the uh, default is uh, level DB, but because uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty performant. Um, but there are uh, many, many other options. So you can kind of use any sort of um, database you want to organize your, op uh, your objects. But this, this is an important distinction that they're not, um, the, the way objects are, are represented on the file system is different in Fedora 4 than it was in Fedora 3. Um, I did mention uh, in the previous presentation that it is possible to maintain a, a JCR XML representation of the repository that um, uh, represents the current state. Uh, for transparency reasons, um, but uh, it's just important to note that this is sort of the way things are on the file system. And again, this is largely for performance reasons. This is kind of uh, Fedora 4 sits on top of mode shape, and this is how content is, is, um, uh, is organized. Uh, another distinction here is uh, uh, between sort of PIDs and paths. So in Fedora 3, uh, every object has a persistent identifier or a PID, um, and these are sort of assigned when the object gets created and are more or less unalterable. Um, they're not something that you can really change within the repository structure. Uh, so navigating that object uh, is always a matter of sort of finding its, its persistent identifier. Uh, in the Fedora 4 context, things are a little bit different. So when you create an object, uh, everything is assigned a sort of internal mode shape uh, UUID. Uh, and this is something that you may or may not want to expose to users. There's still some debate in the Fedora community in terms of best practices uh, and uh, standards will evolve as, as we kind of deal with more use cases around this. But this is a permanent unalterable identifier. So it's always a safe way to find the object if you need to. Um, in addition, uh, objects uh, also have a path uh, to their uh, location within the tree structure in the repository. Uh, and this can be user defined. So you can define your own path and then provide that as an identifier for people to find the object. Uh, or they can be kind of opaque paths. They can be uh, generated through a, a PID minter, um, which, which is um, uh, available in Fedora 4. Uh, or you can plug in a different PID minter if you don't like the, the way that Fedora um, by default generates a, a, a path to, uh, to the object in the repository. Um, so um, just sort of the, the different ways that objects are identified. Uh, and of course, there's nothing stopping you from using additional identifiers. Uh, if you want to use DOIs or you know, arcs or handles or, or whatever, you can, you can generate those as well. Uh, just attach them to the object as a, as a uh, property and 
um, refer to the object as such and choose what your, you know, your application layer will kind of choose what users actually see. Uh, this is just sort of the under the hood uh, functionality that, um, uh, that Fedora 4 provides. Um, so those are the kind of the main differences. Um, there are probably some other smaller ones, but, but certainly those are kind of the, the, the main things that you'd want to take, a, take into consideration when, when sort of looking at Fedora 4 as it compares to Fedora 3. And we'll have some time afterwards for questions if you want to dive into some of these items in a little bit more detail. Uh, now I'll shift a little bit to talking about uh, some of the considerations you might have for uh, thinking about moving your content over to, um, to Fedora 4. Um, so one consideration here is this idea of um, ingesting or projecting. So uh, projection, uh, sometimes called federation, uh, but we've been using that term less because it, it kind of has other connotations. Um, projection is a feature that's sort of supported in Fedora uh, where you can have Fedora connect to um, an external system and represent content in that system uh, as if it had been ingested into Fedora without actually ingesting it. Uh, so a common use case here is, is to plug Fedora into an external file system, and there's a connector right now that exists for that, um, and have Fedora represent that content, uh, and it looks, you know, everything looks like it's been ingested into Fedora, and you can still manage it through Fedora, uh, but the content actually exists on an external file system. Um, and this is potentially advantageous if you have uh, very large numbers of files or, or very large files on an external system and you don't want to go through the process of ingesting directly into Fedora. Um, you can have Fedora connect to that system and, and project over it. So there's lots of use cases for that. One possible use case might be as a stopgap measure to have Fedora 4 actually project over the Fedora 3 REST API um, to represent Fedora 3 content in Fedora 4. Uh, so if you were kind of pursuing a migration strategy, uh, you may want to kind of run your Fedora 4 concurrently with your Fedora 3 and just sort of sit Fedora 4 on top of Fedora 3 to represent the content that way while you slowly do sort of content migration directly into Fedora 4, maybe doing data enhancement along the way. And then at some point you can just turn your Fedora 3 off and flip things over to um, displaying the content in Fedora 4. Um, so that's an option for, for how to migrate if you don't want to sort of migrate directly. Um, one, uh, one potential drawback to projection, at least if you're not, if you're sort of um, not performing other intermediary operations, is there's no real opportunities there for data enhancement. So it's just going to kind of, you're not actually making any modifications to your objects in Fedora 3, you're just sort of displaying them in Fedora 4 and, and making them look like they're in Fedora 4. So if you kind of want to take advantage of some of the linked open data capabilities, for example, um, this might be an okay stopgap, but it's probably not a solution. You probably don't want to have, have to maintain a Fedora 3 and a Fedora 4 repository concurrently and, and sort of uh, just do that forever. You probably want to migrate your objects eventually. Um, but this is a potential stopgap measure for um, making sure that you can kind of run these side by side without uh, having to do all of the migration work up front. Uh, another important consideration is security. Most people are running some kind of security in their Fedora 3 uh, repository. Zacmol is popular uh, as Fedora 3 security. There are others, uh, security schemes. Uh, and this is a little bit of a case-by-case -case basis. There will certainly be standards. So if you're running Hydra, for example, uh, the Hydra community will kind of figure out how to um, migrate security from you know Fedora 3 to Fedora 4 in the Hydra context, and you'll be able to use that. But if you've kind of written your own Fedora 3 implementation or front end, um, then you'll probably need to do a little bit of work to uh, make sure that your security policies in Fedora 3 are um, represented in Fedora 4. There may be some translations involved. So Fedora 4 does support ZACML 2.0, but it's very likely that your Fedora 3 ZACML policies in the current form won't just work in Fedora 4 if you drop them in. You probably will have to do some work to make sure that Fedora 4 um, understands your, uh, your, repo your previous repository's policies, uh, but the framework is there to make all that stuff work. So it's just a matter of during the migration process, migrating over your uh, security policies so that they uh, are interpreted properly by the ZACML framework in, in Fedora 4. If ZACML is your um, security standard, you might be using something else, and if you are, um, then it'll just be a matter of determining whether you want to translate your current security um, framework into uh, uh, 
Zachmul or into a role-based framework, which is currently supported, or to do something else. Uh, and again, the security framework in Fedora 4 is pluggable, so uh, it is possible to implement something other than what currently exists. Uh, but this is an important consideration if you're currently running uh, security on your Fedora 3 repository to think about how that's going to be re represented in Fedora 4 and what work you might need to do to translate that. Uh, versioning is another important consideration. Um, so uh, if you're using versions in your Fedora 3 repository, um, you're going to need to basically uh, iterate through those versions and copy them over to Fedora 4, effectively creating new versions, but um, just copies of the ones from Fedora 3. And that introduced certain problems. For example, the new version will, you know, the last modified date of that version will be the date that you iterate through it and convert over to Fedora 4. So you may need to think about um, what to use as a data identifier for that version. Maybe you don't want to use the system generated last modified date. Maybe you want to actually uh, tag that version with a, a date from a metadata standard um, from Dublin Core Mods or something like that, that more accurately represents the date that is most relevant to that version, whether it's the date that that version was um, created in the Fedora 3 system uh, or some other sort of kind of semantic representation of what that date means. Um, this, for those of you interested in this, is currently being kind of thought through and implemented um, by Penn State in their um, uh, their uh, beta pilot. Uh, they have a lot of Fedora 3 versions that they'll be converting over to Fedora 4 versions. Um, so you may want to uh, track that beta pilot, maybe get in touch with them. If, if you're also dealing with versions in Fedora 3 and you kind of want to wonder, or you're, you're sort of wondering what the, what the standard practice is here. And the best way to handle it but certainly it's a consideration in determining uh, how you want those versions to um, be represented in fedora 4 and, and how to translate those over many people in fedora 3 use content models in a very thin way certainly in um, islandora and hydra this is the case uh, content models are little more than labels uh, and the application stack basically handles all the logic there so in the islandor context you might have a basic image content model. There's no logic in that content model. The content model doesn't enforce anything or do anything. It's just a Fedora object uh, with a PID and the uh, application layer uh, looks for a PID, uh, basically looks for that PID uh, in, in reference to an object and does a bunch of stuff related to that. So um, if that's uh, currently how you're using content models, then in Fedora 4, uh, you can do the same thing. Fedora 4 does have a, a concept of a content model in, in terms of a compact node definition. Um, you could give that uh, an identifier and just use it as a label and let your application worry about how to actually handle the, the, the content modeling. So uh, you can do in Fedora 4 exactly what you did in Fedora 3. Um, however, there is support for more robust content modeling. Andrew's going to give a bit of a demo of this in the, in the next session, but um, through using the capabilities um, of, uh, of mixins and content node, uh, compact node definitions, you can um, set up and enforce um, content modeling at the Fedora layer. And this is potentially more interoperable. Uh, it's, it's a potential opportunity for um, repositories that have different application stacks on top of Fedora to use the same content models and, and be able to enforce them across repositories. Um, that's certainly something that's uh, a possibility, but it's not necessarily the direction the community needs to go. Um, so, you know, the, this is a uh, pretty new territory. The capabilities are all there in Fedora 4. Um, but I think if you have an interest in content modeling, and particularly if you have an interest in interoperability uh, when it comes to content modeling, you should probably try to make your voice heard on this and join the conversation. Um, again, mailing lists, um, committers calls, um, committing some developer time, uh, communicating with the beta pilots um, in the application communities like the Hydra and Islandora communities. And, and get in on the discussion about how to handle content modeling. Because um, Fedora is providing all the tools here, but it's really up to the communities um, that are implementing Fedora to decide um, how to proceed with, with this idea of content modeling. Um, I mentioned uh, that we would get into disseminators uh, and we will, uh, we will discuss these. Uh, so some folks are using disseminators in Fedora 3 um, and they're used uh, for a fairly common set of tasks. Uh, XSL transforms are very common. Um, derivative generation is very common. Some folks are using them for security applications. Um, but there's a fairly limited set of use case for disseminators. Uh, and in Fedora 4, uh, there are no disseminators, uh, so to speak. There's nothing called a disseminator. There's no direct equivalent to 
a disseminator. But what we're interested uh, in getting are the actual use cases behind disseminators in Fedora 3 so we can uh, implement something equivalent or better in Fedora 4. So uh, don't worry so much about what it's called. We don't actually need to have something called a disseminator. We just need to reproduce or enhance the functionality in Fedora 4. Uh, so it's probably going to be a different structure. And I think anyone who's worked with disseminators in Fedora 3 knows that the way that they were implemented is actually really difficult to work with. So we're not just recreate that. Um, but we do want to provide similar functionality. So we did put out a call uh, a few months ago for some use cases around this. And the one institution that had initially indicated that they had some disseminator use cases came back and said, actually, we don't really have those use cases anymore. We find, found another way to do it. So if you are an institution with disseminator use cases and you're concerned about how to reproduce that functionality in Fedora 4, uh, now's a great time to get in touch and let us know what those use cases are um, using the same channels I mentioned before. Um, and we'll work towards trying to um, make sure that those use cases are supported in Fedora 4, but the mechanism will be different. We're not going to have disseminators, but we're going to have uh, something to provide equivalent functionality once we understand what the use cases actually are. Uh, again, we just haven't seen them yet. There are no disseminator use cases um, that I'm aware of that have been sort of uh, brought to our attention. So, uh, so please do that. Please bring us your disseminator use cases. Uh, we can talk about them today if there's time uh, and talk about how we can handle that in Fedora 4. Um, and there are some, probably some other considerations here. Um, so I'll finish up the slide deck here and we can kind of go back to a conversation on this. But now is a good time to maybe think about uh, whether there's anything that I might have missed here. Uh, and as Andrew mentioned before, um, you know, this is, this is sort of a, uh, you know, a pilot workshop. Um, and you, uh, as a group, may have use cases that are very particular to your institutions, uh, in addition to maybe thinking of some that have broader appeal. So um, if you do have other uh, considerations for migrating that you, you kind of want to talk about, uh, just make a note of it. And as I finish up, we'll, we'll come back and have a conversation about that. But uh, we definitely want to gather up those migration use cases because now is sort of the time when we uh, really need to be pushing on this so that by the time 4.1 comes around, we actually have uh, work done on this. And we have some tools and we, we understand the use cases. Uh, so I'm just going to finish up here talking a little bit about some of the enhancements. And these are really just um, opportunities for uh, improving your uh, your data and, and, and making things better in Fedora 4. Uh, and I talked about this a little bit in the previous presentation, but uh, I think there are lots of opportunities here for uh, not just representing stuff in Fedora 4 the same way it was represented in Fedora 3, but actually making things better. Um, so um, one way, of course, is taking advantage of these properties. So resources have properties now instead of just supporting uh, data streams. And these are quite lightweight and granular compared to XML. If you want to um, target a, a property, you can target it directly. You don't have to, uh, you know, load the XML and then search through it to find a particular uh, element in the XML in order to pull that out. The, the properties are all distinct uh, RDF triples, and so targeting them with a query uh, is a lot easier than, than trying to uh, parse XML uh, and look prone to breaking. Um, so uh, I think that's a, a clear advantage. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, inline XML is, is, is not supported here, so we do have to translate that. But translating the inline XML into properties may be a really good way to go, um, maybe uh, a way to, to kind of um, improve things. And, uh, of course, you can still use um, a, a data stream for that. You can use uh, an XML data stream. But I, I think properties, uh, specifically because they're natively uh, RDF in their response formats, really do open the door for some, um, some really useful uh, opportunities here. We had talked a little bit about you know, a querying an external triple store uh, to do things like uh, data visualization and, and sharing and dissemination, um, and potentially, um, you know, taking advantage of the fact that you can point at URIs and communicate with things outside the repository. Um, and the, these query possibilities, I think, are um, really interesting. This is something that we didn't have before in, in Fedora 3, the possibility to do uh, very complex external queries on uh, directly on the um, on the triple store and, and being able to um, uh, come up with some interesting visualizations and things like that. Um, so you know, web applications could uh, take advantage of some of these things. Um, you can do uh, sharing and dissemination of data, pulling things in, but also pushing things out. Um, you know, there are ways to do that using the OAI PMH, for example. But uh, there are potentially better ways to share data if everything is expressed as an RDF property and a standardized topology accessible through a standardized set of REST APIs. 
um, or queryable against an external triple store using standardized Sparkle queries. So um, having all of this sort of standardization uh, and, and semantic capability, I think really opens the door um, to doing some really interesting and unique things with the Fedora repositories that we just haven't seen before. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's much more kind of future thinking. It's much more thinking about how to participate in the semantic web in, in ways that uh, Fedora repositories have traditionally been more closed off. And sometimes the application stacks on top of them are doing things uh, that make them a little bit more open. But um, this time around, uh, from the repository layer itself, we actually have a lot of this functionality um, built directly in. Um, so there's some really uh, interesting new possibilities here. Um, and in particular, just sort of metadata enhancements. So as I said, you know, you can still maintain XML data stream to your metadata, but by converting it to, to an RDF-based schema and using URIs, uh, taking advantage of, of some of these opportunities, um, you really have uh, the ability to kind of link out to things, um, targeting authorities uh, that are external to the system um, and being able to sort of uh, participate better um, in, in the semantic web. So, I mean, all of these are sort of the, the, the possible enhancements to uh, a platform that, that really kind of takes linked data um, seriously as, as a core part of, of the offering. So, you know, interoperability is, is more than ever before one of the driving forces behind, uh, behind Fedora 4. And I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities that are currently unexplored. Uh, and we're interested in hearing about ways people uh, may want to use Fedora in, in ways that they just haven't been able to before. Um, so there's really, um, it, it's, uh, it's a whole new world of opportunities.